I want to welcome each of you today to the question and answer portion of live Bible study. This is from uh, questions and answers uh, that did not get addressed last Tuesday evening. And uh, so we'll be sharing some of those here in just, just a few, few moments. I want to encourage you to uh, make sure and tune in to tonight's live Bible study at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And I know you'll be blessed. Um, and I just appreciate your participation. Appreciate your faithfulness uh, with these uh, live Bible studies. And, and uh, you know, it's, our, it's Andrew's heart as well as our, uh, the heart of each of the instructors and individuals that he has uh, participating in this that, that we answer questions from the Word of God that we don't give you our opinions, we just give you God's Word. Opinions are like, are like noses. Everyone has one, and they're usually full of holes. Well, I want to tell you a funny before I start today. This is some uh, humor from Will Rogers, the old Oklahoma statesman who uh, died in a plane crash in 1935, but he was uh, quite a wise man. It would be, be great to uh, restore some of this wisdom today, but, but this is some humor from him. Uh, first of all, he said, never slap a man who's chewing tobacco. <laughs> Number two, never kick a cow chip on a hot day. <laughs> That's great. Number three, there are two theories to arguing with a woman. Neither one works. <laughs> That's great. Number four, never miss a good chance to shut up. <clears throat> Number five, always drink upstream from the herd. <laughs> Number six, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. <laughs> That's great. Um, then let me see, let me get uh, the next one is uh, let, letting the cat out of the bag is a whole lot easier than putting it back in. And then finally, uh, after eating an entire bowl, a mountain lion felt so good, he started roaring. He kept it up until a hunter came along and shot him. The moral of that story, when you're full of bull, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> oh, that's greatness. Well, uh, we're going to address a number of questions that were turned in that did not get answered last Tuesday night. And so we'll start on those right now. Uh, Crystal42 on chat. Uh, ask, how do we know for sure if we're doing what God wants us to do? I'm halfway through registered nursing school, but is that what God wants me to do? How do I get confirmation? Well, great question, Crystal. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11, um, it's, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and to hope. It tells us that God, God's got a great plan for our lives, not of evil, but of peace. And that word peace includes uh, the definition of prosperity, to give us a future and a hope. And that's true for each one of us. But the reality is that doesn't happen automatically. I don't know if you figure that out yet. But verses 12 and 13 of Jeremiah 29, 11, Share with us how do we get, how do we enter in to the will of God and how do we enter into the plan and future He has for us? Verse 12 says, "Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I'll bring you back from your captivity." And so he's telling us here, that the key to entering into the plan and the, of, of, of the purpose of God, the will of God for our lives, which includes prosperity and peace, a future and hope, uh, is to call on Him and to seek Him and His will for our lives with all of our hearts. Now, you can't, here's the thing, Crystal, uh, and everyone else watching, you can't find God's plan and His future that he has, he has for us while, while we're pursuing uh, our own 
while we're pursuing the will of the flesh. And your flesh has a will. Uh, also, you can't find God's plan and God's will by following the will of others, including your parents, or by following the career path that pays the most money uh, by itself. You know, uh, um, the, God's will and plan is discovered. It's not decided. You know, you, you have to seek the Lord and set aside your own thoughts and your own plans and whatever everyone else wants you to do with your life and say, God, I'm willing. You know, I'm, you've given your life for me, so I'm willing to go anywhere. I'm willing to do anything. I'm willing to follow you and whatever you have for my life. And you know that's uh, that's how Andrew uh, Womack entered into the plan that God had for him. Is his family? Uh, they were all uh, they were all uh, teachers, and they all went to college. And God had a different plan for Andrew. And we have to. And sometimes you have to be willing to offend or or disappoint people that that you want, want their approval in order to follow what God has for you. It's not that we're intentionally trying to disappoint people, but I know in my own life I was successful in business and had just you know, received my dad's approval when we'd been separated for a lot of years since he was, uh, I, I was brought up with my mom and my parents were divorced when I was young and I was looking for my dad's approval and then God calls me after I finally got His approval, He called me in the ministry. And so, you know, the bottom line is, is you have to follow what God has for you. And, but you need to remember that many times we discount the will of God uh, because we don't trust ourselves, uh, even when God does trust us. You know, we make statements like, well, Lord, you know, I, don't, I want to make sure it's not me. I just want it to be the Lord's will. But yet, His will and His plan is going to be Him and you. Uh, you, you, just, you just have to know what part of you wants to do a certain thing or follow a certain career path. Um, is it your spirit or is it your soul? Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. So the Word of God is the only thing that can separate between what's just in our soul or our unrenewed mind or our flesh and what's in our spirit where God dwells. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And so, you know, if you've set aside your own will and your own desires of the flesh, and, and you're seeking the Lord about His will for your life, then you can trust the desires that He planted in your spirit because they're from Him. Psalm 37, 4 says, If you delight yourselves in the Lord, He'll give you the desires of your heart. And so that doesn't mean He gives you whatever you want to do. He's, he's telling you there, if you'll delight in Him or seek Him, that you'll discover the desires that God planted in your heart, Crystal. And listen, if He's put it in your heart, if you have had a, have a desire to go into the medical field and help people in that way, you need to follow that. You don't need to question that. If you're delighting in the Lord and seeking Him in His plan for your life, then you can trust that the desires that He's put in your heart, they're from Him. And the only real confirmation you need about that is the peace that will accompany those desires He's put in your heart, and also the Word of God. So my question to you is, is why did you start nursing school? Are you following the desires of your heart or something else? Uh, do you have peace in your heart, Crystal, about the school and career path? Or have you lost peace? That's the way I would determine if you're in God's will, not by some outward confirmation or some supernatural manifestation like a vision or a dream or, or a prophetic word, you know, uh, or all the stars lining up, you know, or open and closed doors. You open yourself up to deception 
when you're seeking those types of confirmations, though certainly God can use that. So I just encourage you to trust the desires that God's placed in your heart. Uh, Janaby on Facebook said, how can we encourage people about healing, especially when they've experienced the healing hand of Jesus, but have doubts when the same circumstances strike them quite twice? That's uh, kind of the title of this session today is what happens when, when um, you know, the healing that that you, that you received gets attacked or, you, or that sickness comes back again. Well, I appreciate your concern, Janaby, about helping those who've received healing and then experience some of the same symptoms after they are healed. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus shares with us one of the primary attacks of the enemy, and that is the counterattack. And in, in chapter 12 and verse 43, Jesus says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. Notice there's a demon that calls your body his home. And, and when, he, when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first, so shall it be with this wicked generation. And but he's, Jesus is telling us here, when the enemy leaves someone he, if we're through oppression or depression or sickness or disease or whatever, he's going to come back. And he's going to come back and check out and find out whether or not that, that person that he left is filled with the Word of God, filled with the Spirit of God, uh, understands their authority over the enemy, or whether he can come back now and create a worse scenario uh, in, in, your, in your body. And you know, that, this is not given to us to be afraid of the enemy. He roams around seeking whom he may devour. And he can't devour those who are full of the Word. That's why you need to be tuning into these daily live Bible studies, because you'll, you'll understand that what the enemy does is he comes back. When he comes back, he's coming back with a lying symptom. And uh, he'll try to put a pain back on you or a similar symptom. And he's a, trying to attempt you to agree that you weren't healed after all. But you've got to be prepared with the Word of God to resist him and those lying symptoms and take authority over them and run them off and, and the truth and hold up the truth, exalt the truth of the Word that says, by His stripes you were healed above the facts that say you've got a pain in your body. You don't have to deny that there's a pain there, but you, you deny it to have final authority by exalting the truth of God's Word above the facts. And you resist the enemy and be prepared that when he does return with a counterattack, he's going to try to come and, uh, and, and, but you can send him back, the loser that he is. You know, I encourage you, get my book, Scriptures to Live By. You can go on karisbiblecollege.org or gregmore.com, um, and, and you can get that book, and it's got categories of Scripture that you can use to fight the enemy off with, or just study the Word yourself and be prepared for whatever, uh, you know, whatever attack the enemy has, you be prepared for it. Dawn on chat, uh, how can we encourage others that have believed and now they cl claim they no longer believe? What scriptures can I supply? Well, thanks, Dawn, for your care and love for your friend. Typically, a person who was once a believer and says they now don't believe, there's usually a reason or some event that happened that, cl that has closed their heart. They've probably been hurt or offended by someone in the church, a pastor, elder, or faithful member of the church, maybe, maybe even a hypocrite, you know? There's still plenty of hypocrites to go around, unfortunately. But, you know, James 2.19 tells us that even the demons believe in God and tremble. Uh, so the fact that your friend tells you they no longer believe in God doesn't change the reality of his existence. Even the demons who are trying to deceive your friend 
not to believe actually believes in God. And, you know, it's, look, it's impossible. Jesus said in Luke 17, it's impossible, verse 1, that no offenses would come to us. It's going to happen. People are going to disappoint you. People are going to talk bad about you. They're going to betray you, throw you under the bus for their own promotion or benefit. The issue is, what are we going to do with those offenses when they come? If we don't pro process our offenses properly, we get stuck in a time warp of our pain because we're valuing our pain and loss greater than the cross. We're valuing what Jesus did, what, what people did to us greater than what Jesus did for us. Encourage your friend to forgive those in the church who have hurt, hurt them, and then, then and encourage them to choose to live an offense-free life. Uh, here's how I do it. When it comes to people, I expect nothing, and I'm thankful for everything. And remember, if we allow a hypocrite to stand between us and God, the hypocrite's closer to God than we are. And then pray Ephesians 1, 17 through 19 over your friend, and you can look that up. And it just talks about God giving, enlightening their understanding and giving them a revelation of Jesus and His plan for their lives. The faithful alone on, on chat, uh, what should you do when you're over a situation? Well, I'm assuming uh, you're, you're referring to a relationship with someone where they treated you unfairly or took advantage of you in some way or maybe you've gone through a breakup and now you've forgiven them. But uh, how do you relate with them now? Well, one thing is certain. Forgiveness is one thing that you can give someone, but trust has to be reestablished before you can restore the relationship to the place it once was. Um, for example, if there was adultery in a, a marriage relationship or someone mishandled finances, you know, you can forgive the person, but trust is not automatic. The person who stole money from you uh, is not going to be handling your finances next week, even though you've forgiven them. Trust is not dependent upon the person who forgives, but it's more the responsibility of the offender. <clears throat> Dawn on chat, how can we teach others without being pushy? Well, that's a great question, Dawn. You know, I'm assuming that someone has shared with you uh, before or you've experienced others being pu pushy with you. The counsel I can give to you is make it your goal to be a blessing to others. Don't condescend or talk down to them with a fire hose, blasting them with a fire hose of knowledge but sprinkle them with truth. Uh, take people from the known to the unknown. Don't speak to them from a high and lofty place. And just share with them how the Lord has ministered freedom to you and revelation to you. And if people are open and receptive, then you can keep sharing the truth with them. If they're not, don't try to force feed anyone. Uh, just pray Galatians 4.19 that Christ be formed in them, and Ephesians 1, 17 through 19, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. And then if you're, if you're not the one to minister to them, you can pray a, a 1 Corinthians 3, 5 over them, that the Lord send a minister to them whereby they might believe, that they might speak the truth and love to them whereby they, they might believe. Steve on 29 on chat, how do I clear my, get clear on my calling and what, what I need to change? If I'm in a situation where I feel like I'm working at a level that's over my head and I don't know how to manage my position. Well, Steve, I would stay where you are until you know that God is leading you to change. Uh, you may be sensing the Lord stirring your heart uh, and He's preparing you for maybe an impending move. But don't leave until you know. Ecclesiastes 5, I mean 8, 5 and 6, tells us to every purpose there's both time and judgment. The purpose is the what that you know you're to do. Uh, the the, the uh, timing is the when. And then the judgment is the strategy or the how. And you may know what you're supposed to do or 
you know, maybe you're supposed to move or change jobs, but you need to be patient until you know the right timing. And typically, the timing corresponds to when you receive the strategy on how uh, to, to move or the new thing that, um, that, that God has for you. And look, I've never had the Lord ever ask me to do anything uh, in terms of an assignment where I felt completely inadequate for. So I just lean into His grace and uh, His grace makes me sufficient. Uh, Steve 29, uh, one more question. Uh, what does quiet in the Lord look like versus inaction? Well, uh, being quiet in the Lord or waiting on the Lord is not synonymous, Steve, with inaction. Rather, it's devoting our focus on the Lord rather than filling our minds with other activities and challenges and problems. It's spending time seeking the Lord regarding His plan for your life and what's on His heart rather than our own plans. Isaiah 40, 31 says, Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. So waiting on the Lord involves seeking Him and looking to Him for His direction and revelation that He has for you. But you can do that while you're serving other people. So it's been great to be with you. Our time is up today on our live Q&A uh, questions and answers. So, so glad to be with you today. Um, encourage you to tune in tonight. We've got another live Bible study at 6 p.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time. God bless you and just have a great day and a great week.